listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. Kia ora koutou katoa, and welcome to Business is Boring. New technologies hold the promise of giving people a better understanding of the past and other experiences and traditions. But the way institutions work with these traditions means we need to be very careful that they don't reinforce colonial attitudes and practices. Decolonising the digital is the theme of Michaela Jade's Future State presentation, part of the Festival of the Future Spark Lab presents. Michaela is from the Darug speaking nations of Sydney, and she is the founder and CEO at InDigital, Australia's first Indigenous edutech company. She spoke at Semi Permanent last year, and anyone lucky enough to see that will know how cool the work they do is. Their mission is to close the digital divide between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, so together we can use technologies to express 80,000 years of human knowledge for generations to come. Thank you very much, Michaela Jade, for joining us now from Sydney. Kia ora, welcome. Thank you, Watami. That's our word for I see you, Simon. So Watami, and thank you for having me today. Ah, tēnā koe. Hey, um, so... How did you first come to set up the first Indigenous-owned edutech company? Well, with all First Nations stories, there's a very long story behind that, so I'll try and condense it for you. I was a National Parks ranger, so I spent 21 years of my career working in national parks across Australia looking at visitor experiences. So what can the National Parks agencies and directorates do to make people's experience of going on First Nations countries more immersive and how can we have better means to do that cross-cultural communication so the hosts are able to share exactly the right stories, the right knowledge, the right language, the right law to visitors to their country. And I really hated the way that we did that in national parks The way that we did that in national parks was generally to ram a metal sign into a 60,000-year-old culturally significant site. And then the National Park Service would proceed to talk in text via a sign about the people that were there rather than reflecting on the people's culture that's still existing, still has aspirations for the future, but also has very deep connections into deep time. And in 2012, I saw an augmented reality hologram at the University of Canberra when I was doing some work there. And I went home and had a shower and this ridiculous idea came into my mind about imagine you went to a cultural place and you could hold your mobile phone up to a cultural site and a traditional owner would appear in holographic format and share with you from the community's perspective the right story at the right time, at the right place, in the right language for that more immersive experience. And because our cultures uh, operate around land and around seasonality, we couldn't share those stories of seasonality in a sign because it's static and it's there all year. But I thought if holograms could exist, then we could be telling the right story for the right season even and we'd be able to, to work back to storytelling our cultural way. (laughs) So I set about building that and in 2014 built the first Indigenous augmented reality storytelling application and I was invited to the United Nations in New York to showcase the work that I'd been doing and there was 2,500 First Nations people there who saw the technology for the first time and a lot of people started approaching me from across the world to try and make content for them. 
And at that point I had a total breakdown because I realized I'd created uh, or I'd opened Pandora's box and I'd created a Frankenstein, um, which had me at the central point of being the holder of everyone's cultural knowledge, language and lore in holographic format and um, quickly realized that wasn't going to work. The other impeding factor about what I had built with this Frankenstein augmented reality storytelling app was the expense. So it cost $200,000, which I took out as a bank loan, on a National Park Ranger salary to try and build this app, um, and it was costing $10,000 for 90 seconds of content to bring forward these holograms. So no one could afford it. And our mob have 80,000 years way of telling stories it's free. So all of me was like, well, why would we pay $10,000 to convey 90 seconds of content in this format? So when I had my breakdown, I ended up um, doing a speaking engagement at a museum in Sydney and in the audience was someone from Microsoft who believed in what I was trying to do but also could see that there was a raft of new technologies coming online that would be able to help us do this work in a more efficient way, in a more human-centred way and country-centred way that didn't cost a small fortune um, to develop. And, of course, that's using artificial intelligence and, in particular, machine learning. To engineer a lot of those parts, we were having to have teams of, like, 10 engineers and riggers and artists and other creatives to help us co-create the content because the other issue we faced was I'm going to say no, but there was, you know, I'm, I can't be certain there was no, but there was definitely no one I could access from our mob that had the skills and technical abilities to do this for ourselves, including myself. So we had to outsource a lot of the content production. And I just was sitting there at, at this point looking at these new technologies that were in their infancy and looking at what the needs of our community were and and then, again, thinking, well, how could we bring this together in a way that makes cultural sense to our mob. Why would we want to tell our stories using augmented mix of virtual reality technologies? Like what's in it for us? How does it help us share our knowledge, language and law amongst our own communities? How does it help us story tell with non-Indigenous people that might be visiting our country? What are the business models around this? How can we develop a product and service that helps us not to share the stories, but to upskill our own mob in these new critical digital skills. That's so cool. And so under the banner in digital, you were able to bring these things together and provide pathways for people to learn how to kind of control and own their own stories. Because I imagine that must be so important in the context, even if working with really well-meaning institutions like museums or whatever, because there's not a great track record, is there, of um, what people do with the traditions and treasures and taonga of people's culture. Yeah, definitely. So it's something that we went back to the drawing board before we did the second iteration of what Indigital would become was to fully develop our Indigenous cultural, intellectual property and moral rights frameworks and cultural protocols. And that looks at unpacking what cultural expression is, unpacking what cultural heritage is, unpacking all the different forms that our cultures can be expressed through. So we've got, you know, art and language and dancing and you know, all of these things that become alive in a 3D way of presenting our cultures. We had to think thoroughly through, well, what does it actually mean for our mobs to put our cultures into these technologies? who owns it, who can monetize it, what are the commercial opportunities um, for MOB to take our cultural knowledge systems forward in these new technologies, what training gaps exist, and yeah, how can we help support the communities that want to use these technologies to share culture. And what are some of, and I mean, don't, don't, let's dig back into some of those questions a, a little bit later on, because they're, they're the questions of the age, aren't they? Like, you know, what happens with, you know, who owns the data and the people who bring the intellectual property and the, 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 the culture to these things, and then when they get into generative engines, right? Um, but yeah, what kind of stories and what kind of projects have you been able to bring to the world? So we've worked with around 9,000 kids 400 teachers and 170 
community knowledge holders so far to explore what kinds of stories they'd like to tell because at the end of the day it's it's in their hands we just provide the framework and the technology platform and they decide what they'd like to share there's been some fabulous stories around um, you know, obviously people want to talk about our creation stories and that's where a lot of the marketplace is for Indigenous storytelling. But what's actually happened more is people wanting to share their personal stories, especially our elders. So there's been quite a few stories that have been presented using the technology around what was it like to be moved to a mission? What was it like in 1967 to be recognised as a human being for the first time in our country. What is it like to practice cultural law in 2023? What will it be like to practice cultural law in 2060? So quite a lot of communities have decided to cyberpunk their cultures and think about well, what does it look like to be a direct person in 2060 and what will some of the jobs of the future look like and how do we show up as cultural people in these future jobs so what i love about the program that we've built around this technology which is called in digital schools and in digital storytelling for non-school settings is that our mob are really embracing the opportunity to not be stuck in the past mm. <laughs> to not be considered as a monolithic Aboriginal culture to really express the uniqueness of the over 300 nations of First Peoples that are in Australia and to really use the opportunity and the space that we create together to imagine the future. <laughs> and that's what gets me really excited about keeping to do this work with communities because we get little insights across the whole country about what are our kids thinking that they're going to be doing and what do they think it means to show up as a, a cultural person for climate, for um, health, for education, for all these roles that they see themselves in in the future. Yeah, and we'll be back in a moment with Michaela Jade to dig a bit further into the opportunities for the future from bringing this long-term thinking. Welcome back to Business is Boring, where we're chatting to Michaela Jade of Indigital. So where would you describe we are at the moment in, in this world, right? Because a lot of these tools that you were very early to picking up and seeing the application and promise in have now become kind of headline news everywhere, right? With the generative AI and all of these kind of models. And so you've been in these worlds for a lot longer thinking about them. How, how, where, where, where do you think we are today? I think we're all feeling a little bit of deep discomfort around where we are currently because everything is changing. It's not just the technologies, like the technologies are our tools. But what's really changing is um, people's ways of knowing, being and doing as a collective human species on this planet. And I feel like with Industry 4, we're looking at more awareness-based collective action across the board. So there's a real groundswell around people wanting meaning, wanting connectivity, wanting purpose, looking at nature in new ways. So really instead of considering nature as a commodity, we're looking at curated commons where the labour force is changing. So from being a regulated market force to being one based on entrepreneurship. Um, we're looking at externally aware, dedicated capital for investment in businesses. So no longer are investors just wanting to make a quick buck. They're also having to, to answer to their stakeholders and their shareholders about where, where the investments are made. The technology stack is trying to be human centric, although I would kind of uh, I'd kind of challenge that a little saying that we're kind of on the edge of human centricity with technology and we're trying to fight against hopefully what's not inevitable, which is technology-centred technology. -centered technology. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, leadership is more a co-created way of leading rather than just being the sage on the stage or the, the person at the front. 
And we've got this era of conscious consumption. And this is a really exciting time to be alive. I mean, I'm 44. We were talking about this at the Rio Earth Summit in 1994. It's taken this long for us to get to this era of collective action. So I'm really excited about it. But it, there is some deep discomfort around it too, because a lot of the systems that we've been working in um, in the last 20 years are being upended to make way for this new deep innovation era. Yeah, and th there's that lovely idea that if you can solve for uh, Indigenous experience, you can solve for everyone. And, you know, so many of these ideas that, that impact most heavily on Indigenous culture, like the idea of, um, you, you know, the, the plant species just becoming... Um, you, you know, medicine with a patent attached to it or, you know, ancient knowledge just getting picked up and owned and used by other people or, you, you know, land being um, exploited at all costs or, you know, mm. all of these kind of things. If we, if we can solve these, we can solve for everyone. And these same things are present, aren't they, in kind of data sovereignty and what happens with these models. And so, yeah, so we're, we're, what kind of stuff, what kind of principles are you finding that we need to be able to adopt more widely to protect Indigenous knowledge in these spaces? Yeah, well, I think this is something that First Peoples have been asking for practically forever. And we're actually effectively outlined in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People in 2008. So if people want a quick reference guide about what First Nations people across the world are asking for still, uh, it's outlined in those articles, I think. And mostly it's around free, prior, informed consent and self-determination. And they're the foundations of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And you know, core tenets of our cultures as a whole. That's something that we share collectively is our, I guess we're not asking for it, we're asserting it, <laughs> is what we're, we're wanting to achieve. I think what's very exciting about this time is that we have First Nations communities across the world that are AI experts, that are forging into quantum computing, that are already creating parts of the metaverse stack. You know, we're looking at in digital, we're not looking, we're actually working in it already, is looking at the value stack of the metaverse, for example, and looking at how our knowledge, language and law and our ways of knowing, being and doing can help shape the entire stack. So I think something that I would ask people when they're working in metaverse technologies, for example, is we've got a, a value stack. So at the top is the experience stack. We've got you know, the economy that's going to underpin that. We've got digital identity. We've got software um, and platforms. We've got infrastructure and networks. I'd ask people to dig one more level deeper <laughs> and consider land, energy, water, and culture as actually the foundations of the metaverse. And that's where First Nations interactions and inclusion really need to start with the development of any of these critical technology stacks is with land, energy, water, and culture. Because they're not isolated, right? They are grounded in the real world, even if people want to pretend yeah. they're not, because it's kind of easy if you make a new world and you say, oh, well, we don't have to consider anything here, but that's yeah. not reality. It's really not. And I think where our people are getting stuck a little bit with particularly metaverse bridging technologies is everyone's wanting to see our people lean into the very thin veneer at the top, which is the experience layer. You know, we're, we're inherently creative. We've had a foundation in Australia on you know being amazing at sport and being amazing at art and not having us recognised as being the first scientists through technology, engineering, and mathematics, it's 80,000 years old. So I think we need to dig a bit deeper when we're talking about Indigenous inclusion in any of these critical technologies and look at, well, what are actually the foundations of these technologies? Because all of this hinges on things like data centres, which have to sit on someone's cultural country, which consume enormous amounts of energy and water, sitting on lands where our cultural knowledge is imbued in the landscape through our song lines. So we literally have encoded in the lands where all this technology infrastructure sits, the instructions for living on planet Earth. <laughs> and I don't think we can forget that in the critical technology stack. And the, the passage of time, the deepness and richness of time, in a kind of always new, the next big thing, so much news happening at once, ha having that other view 
is so important, especially with some of the big questions that are coming up about are we moving too fast? Are we considering the long term? Are we considering what this means for our descendants enough? Yeah. How are we being good ancestors? That's that's a really great question that we ask ourselves in you know, digital every single day. Um, but I think some of the things, I don't know if you saw the Future of Jobs report come out two days ago from the World Economic Forum, but they've outlined some of the critical skills that are required in the future and what businesses are really calling for now. And yeah, I'm looking at the list of things like creative thinking, resilience, flexibility and agility, motivation, self-awareness, curiosity and lifelong learning. I'm like, are you describing First Nations communities or what? Like we've got all of this in abundance. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we're we're able to tick like literally the top six capabilities of the future within our ways of knowing, being and doing. So we're an incredibly um, ready and gifted contributor to the jobs market just in the way that we operate as cultural people. So I think that's exciting. Yeah, tell us about some of the things that you're optimistic for in this future. Because I think, you know, the media loves the narrative of destruction and awfulness and the world's kind of always ending and, you know, there's always opportunity. What what are the things that, you know, and you've harnessed so many of these technologies for good, right? So, you know, t- tell us yeah. some of the things you're optimistic about. Oh, I'm really excited about the way that all of humanity is through looking through a critical technology lens, like say something like machine learning, for example, is broadening the Western way of thinking into systems thinking. I'd love for the Western culture and Western science to catch up with the way that First Nations think about systems and ecosystems and connectivity and, um, you know, (laughs) the seven generations type of thinking. Uh, I think the technology stacks that we're working in now are calling for that because they are advancing so quickly where all of a sudden faced with the quick consequences of that too. So, for example, with machine learning algorithms where people created entire suites of products and installed them in buildings where when black people put their hands under a soap dispenser, it wouldn't dispense because it couldn't recognise a black hand. Because of the advancements in the tech and the deployment and the quick deployment of the tech, we've seen the repercussions of really bad and poor decision-making and often that's resulted from the, having a lack of diversity in the development teams that are creating these technologies. You know, as a woman, I see a lot of things coming out in metaverse technologies where women just would never, ever think to design uh, a system or a piece of infrastructure like that. An example of that is proximity for avatars in the metaverse. Like, generally... My experience is that men aren't really thinking about how close an avatar should be able to get to another avatar. (laughs) That's like the number one thinking if you're a woman. So I think there are the opportunities for diverse voices and diverse cultures and diverse peoples to be involved in the development of these critical technologies. And I think think we've seen enough quick failures to understand that it's not actually a nice to have, but it's a critical requirement. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so bad to say, like, never in history has a culture gone, hey, let's give overgrown teenagers all of the levers of power and no supervision. <laughs> like, every culture in history has built up a, you know, tradition of elders and experience and long-term thinking, and we're yeah. in a very unusual little experiment. Yeah, we are. Yeah, I, I saw um, at a really big technology conference last year, 18 year olds that were literally multi-millionaires from you know early investments in cryptocurrencies but still goofing around mucking around and having that real those childlike conversations <laughs> about you know basic things and just thinking wow we really need some guidance here about about those levers of power and you know I'm really excited by what young people bring but I also think our culture over 80,000 years has shown us that we need to temper that with the wisdom of our elders And it is the responsibility of young people to seek out that wisdom of the elders too because our elders are tired. They're tired of telling us about what's going to happen. They're tired of seeing the future manifest over and over again when they were talking about the ramifications of decision-making 40 years ago and, oh, what a surprise it's played out many times (laughs) in the way that they said it would. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And and as kind of a, a final thought for, for today, a question we'd like to ask everyone on the podcast is, 
what will you, you know there's so much still to be done in your work but there's so much that's happened already right but what will success be for you and what will success be for the impact in digital can make I had an amazing woman in my life, um, Pamela Craft, and she created this incredible organisation called Tribal Link Foundation in New York, which supports thousands of Indigenous people today to access systems like the United Nations for their human rights. And she had coffee with me before she passed away and she said, Mick, I need you to know that this is your life's work and it won't be completed in your lifetime and you need to be okay with that. And I took Pamela's advice to heart and I think about that every day. What, what are we doing here? What foundations are we setting up for success, not just for our generation but the next seven generations? And for, my, for me that's will what we're doing have impact in 2170? Well, thank you for sharing your story and that viewpoint and um, you know, getting it to take hold in more places around the world and yeah such a pleasure to chat to you thank you for sharing your story Michaela J thank you Simon thanks for having me so thank you to Michaela Jade and do go and check out the work that they've been doing at InDigital. Thank you to you for listening and for everyone who helps make this happen, like our producer, Teihe Butler. Do follow Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to rate and leave a review if you like what we do. E hora. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring, brought to you by SparkLab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on SparkLab, visit sparklab.co.nz.